Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Joan McCabe, Director of Operations, and have been with the MFA Visual Narrative Program since its auspicious launch in 2012. And I'm honored to have written recently elected Story Godmother, although admittedly running unopposed. A warm welcome to everyone, and we really appreciate your time and your focus tonight. The MFA Visual Narrative Program is the managing department for the Rezo Lab and for the storytelling courses offered by our alumni and faculty that you will meet tonight. The MFA Visual Narrative Program offers a fresh perspective and a bold alternative to traditional MFA programs. We do so by recognizing that a command of story is the most powerful and fundamental foundation an artist in any creative profession can possess. Our educational mission is to inspire all students to harness their collective creative writing and visual development talents to amplify their visual narrative skills and master their personal command of story. Our graduates are empowered to be the next generation of transformational, relevant, original content creators. The MFA program in visual narrative prepares them for leadership with the confidence to own their personal voice and their visual narrative expertise to change the world through story. We approach this through multidisciplinary study ranging from character development with a theater director to world building with a game designer to the foundations of visual language with experts in children's books, branding, mapping, film, and photography. We welcome students from diverse backgrounds, even those outside standard art training. A bachelor's degree in any area is acceptable. We're low residency, so during the three summer intensives at SBA in New York, students attend courses supported by a network of industry and market experts. Throughout the four semesters of online study, during the fall and spring, students are able to work remotely and travel without having to uproot their professional careers and family and change their personal lifestyles. Alumni have moved into careers in creative direction, animation, comics, game development, film, toy design, information and motion design, education, and many other disciplines. Recent graduates have worked for such organizations as Apple, Fisher Price, Penguin Books, Disney Plus, Chase, Deloitte Digital, Nickelodeon, MTV2, Exploding Kittens, my favorite, Major League Baseball, Nike, Google, the Boston Globe, and the White House. Others have gone on to successful teaching positions at prestigious institutions such as NYU, Rutgers, Gallaudet, College of Marin, CCS, UConn, CCNY, KCAI, and the School of Visual Arts. I'm here tonight to kick off the CE presentation but we welcome any inquiries about the full MFA Visual Narrative Program as well. You can drop me a line at mfavn at sba.edu and we can arrange and talk to talk in depth another time. We're very proud of our continuing ed offerings. Our alumni and faculty, Suzanne and Sarah, our MFAVN faculty member, Bob, and we thank Penn for his work bringing the Rezo Lab to a prominent place in the printing community worldwide. And now Pan will launch the evening. Pan is an artist, printer, and publisher based in New York. He's the founder of the Rezo Press Mega Press. In 2015, Pan co-founded the Rezo Lab, a Rezograph studio based here at the School of Visual Arts. Since then, he's directed the curriculum and graphic and conceptual identity of the space as manager and faculty member. His work has, has been published by Nevis, Fantagraphics, Landfill Editions, Vice Magazine and others, and he has been exhibited across the US and internationally, including at the Elizabeth Foundation, Printed Matter Inc., the Swiss Institute, the Para Museum in Istanbul, Andreas Melas Presents in Athens, and the Greek Consulate in New York. He's worked with commercial clients, including Bloomberg Digital, American Apparel, Digitaria, Elsewhere Space, iBodega, McDonald's, Lurid Records, and others. Terzis is also the found of the Rezo, founder of the Rezo Press Mega Press. His artist books, zines, and print editions are in the collection of the MoMA Library, the Brooklyn Museum, the New York Public Library, and the collection of Stanford University, among others. So take it away, Pan. Thank you, Joan. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to welcome you all here tonight. Um, and in pre I'm going, to be, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, the Rezo Lab first, and then uh, I'll talk a bit about my classes that I'm offering. Then we'll move on to um, all the other offerings that our other 
incredible fac faculty are offering, um, will be offering this summer, the summer semester. Um, so of course, in pre-pandemic times, we'd be meeting in person, um, even with uh, the number of attendees here, I don't think that we could all cram into our old space, but we would be um, before the pandemic, of course, uh, discussing our classes, showing our space, um, showing off the process, talking a little bit about what resograph printing is. And of course, you get to leave the event with some of these goodies like our color charts, which are actually just usually stealth um, reminders about our course offerings that we've been that we print and publish and distribute around this time at the beginning of the semester. Um, of course, the pandemic forced us to pivot and adjust and see uh, what it is about the way we teach resograph printing that's really crucial and that can be um, can be transmitted and can be communicated through uh, digital um, digital mediums without actually uh, meeting in person and being able to show the actual printing process. It turns out with our online classes that we offered starting in the summer of 2020, and consequently these online info sessions, um, we basically found out after experimenting, after not knowing if it was really gonna work, there's actually a whole lot that we can, uh, that, that you can learn by applying the Rezo, the principles of print design that go into uh, making files a little work with the Rezo uh, press, um, a lot of those principles can be applied to really any other medium. So um, we're happy to have resumed in person, reopened uh, our space. And um, we, in addition to continuing to offer the online classes, which are now taught by Aidan Fitzgerald, our newest faculty member, we are also offering in-person classes and lab access. So. I think you know some of you, a lot of you are here. Some of you might be here uh, because of your interest in the comedy class or the comics journalism class, some of the visual narrative CE offerings. Some of you might be, a lot of you might be here because you're curious about the resograph process. Maybe you've used a Rezo, maybe you know the word. Um, but this is a question that I kind of have, I keep coming back to um, even after working with these machines for, for 12 years. Why is it that a funny sort of stealth um, copy machine, essentially a competitor to Canon and Epson uh, and, uh, and Xerox and all of these sort of behemoths of the Xerox of the photocopy um, world. Why is it that artists have flocked to this medium? What is it about these very unassuming printers um, that has, you know, caused such a such a craze around these machines? Um, you know, I mean. I, the, the, the thing is Rezo itself, um, they don't, they're not, they're, they've, they've been very slow to really come around to, to acknowledging the way artists have been using these, these machines, because really what we teach, the way we use Rezograph printing is really not what these machines were intended to be used for. Um, and really what it comes down to is the fact that, that even though what you just saw looks not that much different from what you might see in an office or an administrative assistant um, scenario, these machines are unique. You're not actually printing with melted plastic. You're not printing with toner. You're printing with specific spot colors. You're dealing with the, uh, the guts of the machine um, and you have a palette of colors that you have to work with and it's up to you to figure out how to mix these colors to uh, create pretty much anything you wanna make. Uh, and that's kind of the point. There's a certain reason look that might have, um, you might have in mind but there's really no limit to what you can use these machines to make. You don't have to follow the, the colors uh, that, you know, the, the, the vivid, bright, kind of full, full strength, 100% um, saturation. You can use this same medium to create subtle images like this photographic print by one of our former artists and residents, Pixie Lau. In addition to using these machines to make print editions, to make zines, to make artist books, um, as opposed to Church, uh, church programs, menus, flyers, what they were actually designed to make. Um, you can also use them to think even bigger, think beyond what uh, small press um, publishers, what, what zine makers and cartoonists have been using to make. You could 
scale up and make an installation like this window display printed matter one of our artists and residents made of the same image back in 2019. Um, so to, to kind of talk a little bit about the Rezo Lab, um, as Joan mentioned in her introduction, and by the way, thank you, Joan, um, for talking about the MFA Visual Narrative Program and for introducing me and the, and the Rezo Lab. Essentially in 2015, uh, Nathan Fox, the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program, uh, reached out to me, he was referred to me because I'd been working with this strange quirky medium uh, in my own way and trying to figure out how to make it work for what I wanted to uh, produce and publish. And um, he, we started talking and we, he basically pulled me into this project to start a space dedicated to risograph printing, which became the Rezo Lab. We started out in 2015 with just a couple of classes. And I was pretty much the only employee, the only faculty member. Um, and a big question as to whether people would sign up for um, full semester classes in a space where we only had two machines um, and, and really dedicate themselves to this process and see what, what they could do with it. Um, and to our kind of surprise, the classes kept filling um, students kept coming back. We added a mini comics class. We added a book focused on photo and graphics. Ren McDonald joined our, our faculty. Um, we added a, a BFA, an undergraduate class, a graduate boot camps, an artist residence program, and a community of artists from across the creative spectrum that included mostly non matriculated SBA students, meaning um, people who were already out there. Uh, you know, making their name in the world of illustration, of photography. Um, we had fine artists, art directors, uh, playwrights, um, all kinds of people who were not SBA students taking classes, learning how to use the medium, figuring out ways to apply it to their own work, and then using the machines um, outside of class during our open lab access times. So the way the lab works is we require a full semester class um, and we do offer a boot camp that is a follow-up course to our online classes. But normally to use the space, you have to take a full semester class um, and then you have unlimited printing, unlimited masters. And you can, uh, during our open lab access hours, we came up with a flat rate model that is designed to keep the space democratic and fair so that everyone kind of has the same entry fee and then no matter what you wanna make, you'll be able to, uh, to, to you know, experiment having made all your mistakes in class, having really pushed these machines to the limit in class um, to see what you can and can't do, do with them. What are the guardrails to push these machines uh, beyond what they were designed to do? So that's basically our model. After you take a class, you can then pay a lab access fee and use the space on your own time. Um, without actually being in a class during our open lab access hours. And just to answer the most common question, yes, um, if, if it hasn't been made clear by what I've said so far, we are completely open to the public. Uh, and so you don't have to be enrolled at SBA as a student, although you, will, you may encounter some of our undergrads some students who took my class who are now paying the lab fee and who are using our space as a core facility for their own production. These posters are, uh, were for an event that we hope to relaunch this summer called the Print Slam that's open to the public as a chance for students to sell um, prints, zines, artist books that they made throughout the semester uh, and you know, really to an audience of the general public. So we'll see if we'll be able to make that work this summer um, as the school starts to relax some of its COVID restrictions. Um, it's always a really incredible event. It's a great chance to see what our students have made throughout the semester. And as you can see, it was, it's been pretty un-pandemic friendly, but uh, hopefully we can you know, squeeze, squeeze everyone in soon. Um, so in terms of, oh, and, and also I just wanna to mention too that um, as Joan said, uh, beyond being a facility that serves students at SVA um, and then also continuing education students, we have, because we our space kind of filled a need that a lot of people didn't know existed, that is providing access to these machines that previously um, you had to know someone who had a machine in their studio. 
Um, we've, we have gotten a nice amount of attention from outside of the SBA ecosystem. Uh, and this is just one example of some recent press, press from a design magazine based in China called Design uh, 360 Degrees. They did a nice little spread on our space and um, a little bit about, um, about you know, where we're coming from, translated into English and Chinese. So, uh, and I would also, um, if you haven't already, please check out our website designed with Rizzo printed textures. There's a gallery. Uh, it'll eventually be an endless scroll as we add more images. Um, if you wanna check out some different examples of student and faculty work. Um, and in terms of my own work and where I'm coming from, I make paintings. Um, I do freelance commercial work for various venues, including this is a poster I did for Elsewhere Space. It's a club in Brooklyn. It's an LP design a job, an editorial uh, illustration job I did for Bloomberg last year. Um, and I also, of course, make Rezo prints. But my, um, the roots of what kind of led me to starting to work with these machines was uh, kind of my, my roots in printmaking. So I studied printmaking. And for me, when I was an undergraduate, that, that really fused all my different interests together, my interest in publishing, my interest in trying to figure out color. It also allowed me a way to create editions that could get out into the world and open a lot of doors for me creatively, professionally. Um, but in terms of my own practice, I had been, by the time I encountered Rizzo, um, the artist books I was making were becoming more and more complex, more labor intensive, more like kind of like art objects. And I was using printmaking uh, in some installation opportunities. I was in exhibitions. So using printmaking more to scale up rather than, than to make books. Um, it was so labor intensive that it seemed like the books I was making, um, the prices made them essentially non, um, non accessible to someone like me. So I was using them to scale up and make, make things like these uh, screen printed sort of print paintings for a show I had in um, Greece back in 2010. And it was around, um, it was around 2009, 2010, where I had a friend who, um, he knew my work through my involvement in the world of scenes and underground comics and artist books and things like that. And he was talking about this machine he'd gotten a hold of called a Rizograph that he described as an automated screen printing machine. It's sort of like my Rizzo origin story. It, I, I couldn't picture what this thing looked like. You know, I, I, I thought my experience of screen printing was messy, it was chaotic, it was physical. It was something you did with your hands, something you, you ended up with paint under your nails at the end of the day. Um, how could you automate that process without having it be incredibly expensive um, and complicated and technical? But I didn't understand when, because he said he had gotten this thing for $200 from someone in Pennsylvania and it came with eight colors. You know, I thought maybe it was very rudimentary. Maybe it was very crude, more like a letterpress, Vandercook printing press with a crank on the side. Maybe there was a plywood box filled with water and you'd end up getting ink all over your shoes. Um, and so, you know, he just kept, he kept basically harassing me to do a project on it. So eventually I met him in the space where he was storing the thing and it was a big empty room. I was looking around for the risograph and there was just this funny looking, slightly too wide, bloated old copy machine. It was a little bit yellow um, and the buttons were too big. The screen looked like a Game Boy and you know, I was trying, I was hoping it wasn't the Rezo, but it was. And I was honestly, I was very let down. I was very disappointed. I was, could, I was like, could this be this incredible machine he's been talking about? But what really blew my mind, what really kind of made me interested and curious was when he opened up the front panel, I pulled out the drum and I realized that feeling of loading up, of, of dealing with these gigantic drum cylinders and having to change those just as a way to use the machine. Um, that, that sort of changed the, the usage of the machine for me kind of conceptually. I, I realized that, you know, this was, you had to really know about the guts of the machine, how it operated to make it work. But also there was this sort of, the fact that it kind of felt like you might be in an office in the 80s somewhere, just, just you know, making copies for the boss. Like that contrast that was really exciting to me in a strange way. So I ended up, um, he locked me in the space. Once I spent a few weeks gathering materials for a project I was working on, I ended up printing my first Rezo book, um, which was about 40 pages, uh, 50 colors. And it would have taken me 
hundreds of hours to do it with traditional printmaking, with screen printing, with photolithography, I was able to do it in one day. Um, and that allowed me to scale up and to launch my press, Mega Press, and eventually start publishing the work of other artists as well. Next thing I knew, I was basically running a small business, participating in art book fairs. Um, and this has remained a core of my, my creative practice. You, you, you know, you make a zine and then eventually you scale up and then next thing you know, you're making books that you have to uh, send off to binders and the additions swell from 50 to 100 to, you know, 500, the more, the deeper you get into it. So I'm teaching two classes, as I said, the first class is a basic intro class um, and it's gonna be running for nine weeks, starts on June 9th. It's uh, our basic intro class. And basically for this class, you end up with a print design toolkit so we go over um, color separations. Uh, we go over how to sort of think in, in the ways that you need to think to really design properly for this process and applying printmaking techniques the way I did. I took my printmaking background and applied it to this process to try to figure it out. So we go through spot colors. Um, the basic concept of working with a limited palette, but pure, 100% blue, 100% red. So you're not you're not just creating a full color image and then having the reason deal that you actually have to design it based on the colors you're working with. Um, we're gonna go over posterization. So the high contrast kind of Andy Warhol treatment and what is the conceptual result of that. We're gonna go over duotone. So starting to use photographic techniques to really render tone in a nice way, CMYK. So taking the, uh, the, the sort of the technical aspects of offset commercial printing and applying them to Rezo and getting sort of a full color result. Um, the other class I'm teaching is a, also an intro class, but kind of geared towards students, pr prospective students who are interested in specifically publishing. Um, so this is a zine class. Uh, if you want to make an addition, this could also be a series of unbound prints. It could be prints in a box. Um, this class also runs for nine weeks and we go over all the basics as well, but we immediately kind of pivot towards making instant scenes, different kinds of binding. These are actually some, some projects that were made by online students because a number of my students in the first summer that I taught the online class had Rezograph. So I was able to get them and they had just bought Rezo. So they were kind of starting to learn how to use their machines and apply these techniques um, to the printing process. So in addition to um, going over the fundamentals, the conceptual approach to making images that you eventually wanna be a book or a zine or a series of prints, um, we're also gonna put it into context by, in addition to showing you um, every week dozens of beautiful examples of Rezo printed books by um, my peers in the world of Rezo printing and publishing, um, other faculty members whose work we have in our collection, also work from my own collection. I'll also be putting into con in the general context of the history of printing and publishing going all the way, not just to Gutenberg, but back to ancient China, where, where movable type was actually invented. Um, Martin Luther, uh, William Blake, where, where can we find the roots of zines? Um, of course, the fanzines of the sci-fi nerds of the 30s and 40s, that's where we get the word, but you can go back even further to really place that impulse of self-publishing of um, if you have an idea and you're not gonna wait for the gatekeepers to bless it with a, um, you know, with a book deal, you just go ahead and put it out into the world. And that's kind of an ancient impulse that goes back even before the invention of printing. Um, and we find a lot of examples of that to sort of place Rezo printing in context. So, and some of these might be, you know, if you want to find out the background behind these, these interesting images that I'm showing, you'll just have to take the class. So um, those are the two classes I'm teaching. And I am very happy to actually, before I introduce Aiden, um, well, you know what, in terms of questions about my class, uh, we're gonna do a general Q and A at the end of the session, but we'll do a mini Q and A after each of the following presenters. So if you have questions about my class, you can save them until the very end. Um, but first, I want to introduce Aiden Fitzgerald. He is our newest faculty member. Um, and 
I'm really happy that he's, he's part of our team now. He was actually also a former artist in residence. So he was an artist in residence at the Rizzo Lab in the summer of 2018. So Aiden is teaching uh, two boot camp or one boot camp intensive. He teach, he's teaching our online classes and a brand new class um, that's gonna focus on artist books and abstract comics. Um, Aiden Fitzgerald received a BFA in painting and drawing from the University of Washington. He was the founder of the free Seattle all comics newspaper Intruder and the graphic designer for the Seattle Small Press Festival April. Um, he started Cold Q Press in 2015 and dedicated his art practice to publishing and showcasing other artists and illustrators. Over the years, Cold Cube has published over 120 artists and writers from all over the world. He was the managing editor of Grandma Poetry, and he has taught classes at Western Washington University, Hugo House, Seattle, and Seattle Central Community College. He lives and now works in New York. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Aiden, if you wanna go ahead and take it away and bedazzle us. With <laughs> with your class uh, yes go ahead thank you pan uh be everybody be prepared to be bedazzled now uh like pan said i'm going to be teaching two classes uh one is an online intro to risograph printing course and the other is um a, an in-person art books and abstract comics class uh i don't want to leave the meeting so let's learn a little bit. Uh, so this is a very exciting image. Um, and this is sort of the, the first image that the intro to risograph printing course will be focused on. And that is the basic concept of when you wanna print something in color on a risograph, you have to break those colors into their black and white uh, constituent parts, right? So that's your first lesson. That one's free. If you wanna learn more, then uh, you got to take the class. But uh, just for um, for fun here, I just want to talk about a little bit about what this intro to risograph printing course is going to cover. Uh, basically, the goal of the course is to uh, go through the five basic fundamentals of risograph printing. That is spot color printing. Here we see a nice example by Daria Tesler. Uh, posterization and duotones. So this is uh, a duo tone in aqua and black. This is from a book that I published uh, last year. Um, uh, and then also um, CMYK printing, four color printing. Uh, this is from an earlier anthology that I published a couple of years ago. Spot colors, duo tones, posterization, CMYK, and then anti-CMYK, which is basically using the four color process uh, to create something a little bit different, right? Shake up the traditional four color profiles that we use uh, in printing. Um, important thing about this intro to risograph printing course that I'm teaching, uh, the goal of the course is for all students at all skill levels to learn these five basic file setup techniques, but also to be able to look at any work out there in the real world or the work that you're making in your studio and go, how can I translate this to risograph printing, right? So we are, uh, I am teaching online. Um, so it will be it's open to everybody all over the world, not just in New York. Um, so if you have a Rizo or if you have access to a Rizo wherever you are, by taking this class, you'll become a better printer or you will become your risograph printer's favorite client because they will not have to email you back with uh, corrections on your files or questions like, you say you want this in two colors, but there's like 48 layers here. How are we gonna do that? Um, uh, one of the big questions that I get in the class is uh, whether or not I record each session. So yes, I do record each class and I also upload um, extra like mini lessons that you can download and take with you after the class is finished. If you haven't gathered from this presentation, I talk a lot. So there's a lot of information that I just throw at you very quickly. So it does help to have the, um, uh, mini lessons sort of to, to bolster your info. Uh, this is a, I'm just gonna walk you through a four color print because it's fun for me. First layer is aqua, yellow, black, and then pink. And so this is sort of an illustration of the amounts of knowledge that you're gonna get. Uh, it's all gonna add up like the colors in that print. Um, 
this is just sort of some of the things that we'll be learning about in the class. This is a, the same image printed in two different uh, modes that the Rizu has, right? There's screen angle and grain touch. Um, and there, here's that same sort of concept illustrated differently, right? This is screen angle and grain touch. Uh, and so all of these concepts might be um, complicated or they might make no sense to you if you have no experience risograph printing, and that's fine. Uh, we will get you that experience once you take the class. So in six weeks, uh, you will get to the point where you're printing, making prints like this. So these are prints from former students of mine that I have asked them if I can share their work. These are all four color prints and they started from uh, no knowledge of risograph printing and then they made these wonderful prints. And you ask, where did they make them? Uh, they made them at the Rizo lab because uh, after you take my online course, which is a six week course, then you qualify for an in-person boot camp at the Rizo lab. That's two days, a Saturday and a Sunday from 10 to two. Uh, there's one boot camp in July and one in August, I believe. Uh, Ren is taking over the one in July and I'll be doing the one in August. Uh, so after you qualify, after you take my class, you can take the boot camp, and then you are sort of certified, a certified Rizograph printer. Uh, and then the other course that I'm teaching Oh, here's a little uh, printing guide that uh, you will, it's a PDF that uh, you will have access to. You can download it and take it with you. It's nice uh, if you take my course. Uh, the other class that I'll be teaching is a course on um, abstract comics and um, art books. And this is a really, uh, it's my favorite topic. Uh, I run a publisher called Cold Cube. We publish abstract comics and art books. And um, a big part of this class is gonna be sort of going through um, the books that I have and the books that hopefully you bring to the class and sort of breaking down uh, what they are and how they work and why they are, right? So art books and abstract comics, I've always found are kind of weird because they are defined by what they are not, right? They're not narrative comics, they're not photo books, they're not poetry chat books, they're not essays, they're not like comics journalism. They are sort of, they exist in this weird, uh, ether, right? So this is just a couple of shots from my collection. Um, and then I'm just going to kind of, these are some of the books that we'll be looking at. These are all printed on a risograph, some published by me, some published by my peers. Um, but these are the types, this is the type of work that we will be sort of looking at and examining and uh, critiquing uh, in my abstract comics uh, course. And that is in person. That is on uh, Mondays, starting on June 6th. Um, and so a lot of these are sort of abstract books here, but there's also a couple of comics that we'll be looking at as well. So this is a book by Antoine Cosset, um, and you can see that it incorporates some sort of abstraction that utilizes the risograph printing method, but also is using that abstract concept to reinforce uh, the narrative, right? So we're not only going to look at abstract work, we're also going to look at narrative work, but how that uses the language of abstraction and, com and abstract comics to sort of enhance the books themselves. So this is a different Antoine. This is Antoine Orand, uh, also a risograph printed comic, wonderful uh, cartoonist. This is a book that I published by uh, Cynthia Alfonso. You can see it's basic sort of like, well, not basic, but it's it's got the panel layout of a traditional comic, but uh, is clearly uh, on the weirder abstract side here. So, um, yeah, this is some of my favorite work and this is some of my favorite stuff to talk about. So I would love to talk about it with you. And uh, yeah, that is uh, once again, Mondays on, um, there we go, nine sessions, nine weeks. Uh, and it is going to be a fun one. So yeah, come on by, it's gonna be great. Thank you. We have time, so after each uh, presenter, after each of our faculty gives a short presentation of their classes and work, um, we can take a few specific questions if anyone has specific questions about Aiden's class. We could also save them for the Q&A at the very end. Any questions? Um, can I ask real quick, um, why is it four hours? Oh, great question. Um, so, uh, we are learning in the Rizzo lab and we are going to be, um, you know, making our own work on the Rizograph printers. So the four hours allots enough time for me to sort of gab at you for an hour and then do a critique for an hour 
uh, and then take a break to, you know, get a glass of water or something, and then uh, work on your own work and print for the remainder of the class. So it's a sort of an all encompassing um, lesson critique and work session. So uh, it is evenings and um, we will have sort of full access of the lab. So there are four machines in there, uh, but we won't really have to wait in line as much as we would um, if, in during like the regular print time. But yeah, it's 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 the 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 lengthy time stamp there is to accommodate the four the three main aspects of the class. Thank you. And and I should also I mean uh, uh, in addition to those four hours, you, you'll also have access. You'll be able to sign up during the open lab access hours and reserve a machine outside of class for your own uh, printing for up to up to four hours at a time, six hours per week. So. Any other questions for Aiden? All right, um, so I wanna, uh, we're gonna move on. If you have any questions you just thought of, uh, you can save them until the very end, uh, but I'm gonna move on and we're going to um, uh, introduce um, our next presenter who's Suzanne Reese. And Suzanne Reese is a writer and illustrator who creates visual essays and comics poetry and writes creative nonfiction, short fiction, and poetry. In addition to teaching, she also works as a professional copywriter in advertising. Her interests include non-sequential visual storytelling, book arts, and DIY publishing. Suzanne holds a bachelor's degree in German language and literature, um, a master's degree in art history, and she earned an MFA in visual narrative from the School of Visual Arts. She was a Fulbright Scholar in Munich, Germany, and Whitney Research Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her work has appeared in No Tokens, O Reader Magazine, Red Ink Poetry Comics, among others. Suzanne is currently on, at work on a comics poetry collection as in the process of starting a micro press and zine. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And so Suzanne, if you wanna just go ahead and talk about your class and present some images, take it away. Oh, Suzanne, Suzanne, uh, you're uh, muted if you want to just um, unmute yourself and start over. Hi, I'm Suzanne. Um, I am teaching the summer a class that's called Creative Writing for Visual Artists. I um, I designed this course um, to help people who maybe have not written in a while, um, maybe since they were they were in school, um, or maybe had um, a not great experience in a writing class, um, or think because they're visual arts, or have been told because they're a visual artist that that you also can't write. Um, the course is meant to um, kind of introduce you to some fundamentals of writing craft and to give you a chance to experiment and play and try some different kinds of writing. Um, so um, my work, um, as Pan said, I write poetry, I do visual essay, I also do comics. Um, most recently, over the last couple of years, I have been really focused on comics poetry and I teach a comics poetry class. I taught it in the fall and hope to teach it again um, in the spring. But um, this, um, this fall is the writing class. Um, it's just writing. Um, it is for any level of experience. Um, it, it's in a supportive and empowering um, environment. You know, I don't know, I have experienced in the past some really not very nice and not very fun writing workshop environments. Um, and this is the opposite of that. Um, it really is about fostering that sense of experiment and play um, and in order to sort of develop a regular writing habit. Um, you will experiment um, by writing short fiction. You'll get to try some creative nonfiction. So personal writing and also poetry. 
You will also learn by reading and discussing with your classmates and with me um, a selection of work by a diverse group of contemporary writers. Um, you will also learn by sharing your own work and discussing it with your classmates. Um, the course is designed for visual thinkers, and that means that it is um, you will get a series of prompts in class um, using um, photographs, illustration, paintings, and all of these are things that you identify as something that's intriguing to you and that you bring into class to work with. Um, and over the course of the, the 10 weeks that we work together, you will create a portfolio of writing. Um, and you will have also have the opportunity to submit to Spring Writer, which is a zine that I have started. Um, I'm currently laying out the second issue um, of it that um, publishes student work from my classes and also some of Sarah Shaw's classes um, this semester uh, from some of her students from the fall. Um, I will be um, doing some of their work. Um, and Spring Writer here are just some, some it's got some of um, student work from my class. Um, this is from the first issue. Um, some little creative, a little um, fictional letter to Andy Warhol, um, a poem by Wendy Yang called My Little Corner that's about her um, living in a New York City apartment. Um, she's from Taiwan. Um, and then there is um, Maria Tapia, who is going to be a, a student in the beginning class this year in the MFA program for visual narrative. And she wrote a poem about her mother um, based on a photograph and she did this beautiful illustration. So that's the kind of stuff that um, students in the class do and that I am happy to publish and share. So um, really that is, you know, that is a very short and sweet um, aspect of it. I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Um, you can reach out to me by email at sreese at sva.edu. And I'm on Instagram um, if you want to see more of my work and the kind of stuff that I do. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Does anyone have any questions for Suzanne right now while we have her? You know, of course, you can also uh, you know, jot down notes and save your questions for the end. So. All right, so if we don't have any other questions, um, right, last call. All right, so um, I want to move on to introduce our next presenter who is Ren McDonald, also a former artist in residence. Um, Ren McDonald is an illustrator and cartoonist based in Brooklyn, New York, now based upstate New York, right? It's in Valley. Still, still one foot in New York, so it's uh, that's right. You know, once a New Yorker, always a New Yorker. He's the author of the cyberpunk epic Sparks and dystopian revenge story Cyber Realms, as well as several other self-published mini comics, including including his current series Precinct X99. He edits the genre-based comics anthology X Mag for Piao. He's worked with publications such as the New York Times, the New Yorker, Vice and Wired, and also recently worked on the Midnight Gospel for Netflix. So I'm gonna let Ren um, talk a little bit about his work and classes. So go ahead, Ren. Thanks, man. Uh, hey, 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 uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up and listen, listening to us chat about our classes and everything. So I'll chat a little bit about myself. Um, I am, uh, like Pan said, I'm a cartoonist and an illustrator. This is some of my work. Uh, you can see more up-to-date work on my website. This is a lot of my comic stuff, a lot of which was actually printed uh, at the Dusa Lab. Um, and here's a little bit of my illustration stuff. I also do a lot of um, freelance and editorial, and uh, I'm currently working on a children's book right now. So um, I uh, have uh, many um, uh, pots on the fire. Uh, anyways. So uh, the class that I teach is mini comics from page to production. Uh, and the goal is to create risograph ready narrative based mini comics in the course. Um, and mini comics for anyone that doesn't know are comics that are typically self published handmade and are on the smaller side. Um, they are one of my favorite mediums of all time. Uh, they utilize short stories, which I absolutely love. Uh, they're typically self-contained and or part of a series. Um, and uh, I always think they're just like such a fun uh, showcase of an artist's work. 
So uh, what we focus on in the course is a step-by-step -step process to create a mini comic. Uh, and those steps uh, contain an idea, an outline, thumbnail sketches, rough art, final line art, color setup, printing, and binding. So uh, throughout the whole course, we go through that step-by-step. -step, and along the way, we also cover risk printing basics. So um, a little bit of what you'll get uh, in all of the other uh, previous courses that were also mentioned. Um, and then a zine production basics, because like I said, um, many comics are self-published uh, zines. So it's, it's the form of a zine. So uh, all the cutting, binding and assembly, all that stuff. Uh, and what we'll actually be creating is uh, we'll start out with a fourfold uh, center cut zine, uh, also known as single sheet zines, also called as instant books, also uh, known as uh, instant zines. There's like a million different names for this, uh, but it's really fun. Um, and uh, it's a way to just take a single uh, sheet of paper and turn it into an eight page uh, zine. Uh, and in this case, eight page or eight panel comic. Um, We'll, uh, have, you'll have the opportunity to create a variety of prints utilizing different techniques that we cover in the course. Uh, but the main focus of the course is to create a 12 to 20 page uh, mini comic from start to finish. Uh, and the structure of the course, uh, depending on the semester, it'll be 10 to 12 sessions. Um, and the, the focus is kind of split up 60 to 40 percent uh, sixty percent comics, forty percent reso, um, and the the first half of the class will be a little more rigorous, focusing on uh, technique and discussion. Uh, we will uh, in each step of that mini comic making process, uh, you'll bring in uh, your work at whatever stage you're in, and and the class will discuss it and um, talk about what's working. Um, and uh, then the remainder of the class will be more focused on completing your mini comics. So once we get all the uh, structure um, and give you all the tools that you uh, need to create this stuff, I, I like to take a step back uh, and let you actually work on it because creating mini, mini comics, creating comics in general, it, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, I always think of it as like, uh, you know, you're not creating one illustration, you're creating like 12 little illustrations per page. So uh, that amount to telling a story. So uh, it does take time and, and um, motivation, uh, but uh, it's, it's so rewarding uh, at the end after you put all that work in to see uh, the mini comic, the, the comic and the story that you created. Um, and by the last class, each student will have a print will have printed enough copies of their finished mini comics so that everyone in the class can have one. So uh, this is one of my favorite things about the class is walking in in the last day and seeing all the work that everyone created uh, through the course of the entire semester. Uh, and then everyone gets to walk uh, away with depending on how many people are in the class, uh, you know, like 15 uh, brand new mini comics um, from everyone that they spent a whole semester with. And I think that's so, so fun. Um, so here's some mini comics that uh, were created in the class in the past. Uh, just so much like fun stuff, so many different uh, unique and diverse voices. Um, and it's always uh, so interesting to me to see how each individual person utilizes the uh, risograph technique um, and medium differently. Uh, and yeah, we're gonna have fun. It's it's gonna be a good time. We're gonna really dive into these machines uh, and making mini comics uh, and it's gonna be good. But however, uh, after going through all that, I do have to say that my summer semester for the mini comics class is full up at this point. I will be teaching it again in the fall. So uh, if that's really something that piques your interest, uh, do uh, hold out for the fall. I, I do it every semester. Um, so I, I will see you in the fall if you're interested in that. Uh, however, uh, as Aiden mentioned, I am doing a boot camp in July, and this uh, boot camp uh, does typically require uh, the prerequisite of having taken an online course. And it's it's a great way to take that theoretical information that uh, you gained in the in the online uh, sphere of the World Wide Web and bring it into reality, uh, and really getting some hand hands on experience with the machines. Um, We'll be going through uh, techniques like analog printing, limited spot color printing, uh, multicolor printing, duotone printing, Focium YK printing, uh, and of course, cutting our cutting and binding equipment and just getting you comfortable in the space uh, over the course of a weekend, uh, which as you can see the date here is July 9th and 10th. Um, 
uh, and just getting you familiar with the space and comfortable with using the machines and our equipment so that you can then utilize your six weeks uh, of print time after that to go in and uh, create uh, whatever your heart desires. Um, and I will also say while, while this is uh, intended for students that took the online course, if you do have uh, extensive risograph experience and uh, you would like to um, become familiar with our space at uh, the Riso Lab, do feel free to email me uh, or Pan. And also um, uh, any students that have taken uh, uh, any Riso Lab class in the past uh, and just want a refresher, this is a great opportunity for that. And yeah, like I said, if you email me or Pan, uh, we can uh, talk to you about uh, waiving the prerequisite. And that's about it. So, um, Oh, and of course, uh, you know, all the class information is on the Risa Lab website. Um, so yeah, uh, let me know if anyone has any questions about my class or the boot camp or anything else coming up. Thanks, Ren. What a tease. Uh, you know, I was I was getting ready to sign up myself and then, you know, <laughs> not going to be know. possible this semester. You, we do, these classes do have waiting lists though. And I have had, uh, cause the last semester in the spring semester, um, both of my classes were full with a waiting list and, and there was a student that switched out. So that allowed someone that was waiting to, to get in the class. So if you're dying to take this class, you need it to happen this summer. Um, maybe you could sign up and maybe that'll open up. But also one more thing I wanted to say about the boot camp is if you're enrolled in the way we scheduled it is that um, you may be enrolled in Aiden's online class. Um, and if you're local to New York, you will have four sessions under your belt by the time uh, the first boot camp rolls around. So if here, if, it, if it, that works out for you, um, we'll also allow students that have, that are in the first online class to take the boot camp before they're finished with it. Cause um, you know, you'll, you'll have enough of the basics down. So there's a few different ways to get in that boot camp. If you haven't taken a class previously, um, any questions, real quick, for for Ren before we move on to our last two faculty members? No. Okay. Um, all right. So, and, and again, you know, we'll do a general Q and A at the end. So, if you if you do have any questions, you can that you think of between now and then, um, you can just uh, raise them at the end. So. Next up, we've got Sarah Shaw. Sarah is a comics, illust comics artist, illustrator, and visual arts educator, and a graduate of SVA's MFA Visual Narrative Program. She makes memoir and nonfiction comics about daily life, culture, travel, living abroad, and women, uh, women from history. She spent 10 years working abroad in Korea, Colombia, and Nepal before moving to Boston, Massachusetts in 2020. Her comics and illustrations have recently appeared in the at the Boston Globe and the White House website. Um, and congratulations on that most recent gig. Uh, Sarah, I saw that when it came out. So um, go ahead and Sarah, if you wanna go ahead and tell us about your classes and a little bit about your background and work. All right, great. Hi everyone and thank you, Pan. Um, let me just share my screen with you all and we'll get started. All right, cool. So this summer semester, I'll be teaching um, the comics journalism course. I also teach a graphic memoir course, but I'll be teaching that course again in the fall. So this will be the second semester that I'll be doing comics journalism. It was a lot of fun last semester and I'm excited to teach it again this summer. It's fully online. It's 10 weeks. And um, we will meet every Tuesday night for two hours for a, a synchronous session. So these sessions mostly consist of, um, we'll do like some quick in-class drawing exercises, but we'll have critiques, um, discussions, and we, each week um, there's a new topic, like a new lecture and discussion. But typically it will be about an hour where we'll um, critique and discuss the work, the homework, and then um, about an hour, a little bit less of like introducing the new topic. So um, it's really a good opportunity to connect with other students and um, just have that, that time where you can really um, talk to each other about your work and get that like valuable feedback in a class setting. 
Um, so for the first few weeks, um, I guess this wouldn't be weeks one through eight. This would be like one through seven. But um, we'll make <laughs> so we'll make nonfiction comics. So to see the world through someone else's eyes. Um, these consist of documentary sketches, um, reportage comics, off art pieces, illustrated reviews, explainer comics, biographies. Basically, you'll have a lot of autonomy to choose topics that are of interest to you to make work, um, you know, that really appeals to you and also in styles that you're interested in as well. But for these first weeks, we'll make these quicker assignments and there will be about you know um like a, a two-week assignment as well but it is a lot of work just because i think um i think ren mentioned in, in his presentation that making comics is really time consuming but it's really enjoyable and really gratifying to when you have like this work at the end of the course that you can look back on because you know really you'll have about four or five pieces at the end of the course, um, you know, varying in length. And each week, too, we'll analyze excerpts from a range of storytellers, um, all in the nonfiction genres and um, a lot of different formats, too. We'll look at web comics, we'll look at, um, you know, books and comics in print and, you know, shorter zines and, you know, lots of different stuff to really see also what kind of work you're interested in making yourself and also just by a you know an array of voices too um the great thing right now about how comics are becoming so mainstream is that there's so many different voices now um and it's it's really great to be able to and also global too and be able to read comics that are you know in translation and that sort of thing too um, last semester, we had um, Sarah Glidden speak. Each semester in my classes, I have a guest speaker come and talk about their work. So we'll have a different guest speaker this time as well, but I always record all of these too. So um, students can watch past lectures with different artists and um, also, actually, last semester we had two guest speakers because um, one of my students also asked to bring in um, someone she knew who talked about who, um, you know, who does a lot of cartoons for the New Yorker. So she talked about, you know, like pitching to the New Yorker, too. So there's like lots of different um, types of lectures, too. And those are all accessible as well in the course. Um, and then for the last few weeks of the course, we'll work on a longer narrative. So you'll be able to meet each week um, during the critique time in small groups to discuss your progress with um, a smaller group of people that have more time to really talk about your ideas. And um, this is something that students um, have typically really liked about the course because they've been able to really, you know, have that valuable feedback time. Um, and so, you know, we'll follow a, pro a process where spend time brainstorming, you know, can, this is all nonfiction, so many students choose to conduct interviews and, you know, craft their story. And then, of course, there's the whole process of, of making, crafting the art and, you know, inking and coloring and, and all of that, too. So um, it's a lot of fun, though, each week, too to go through your work together. And, um, and I always try to mix up the groups too, to have like lots of different students um, have their eyes on your work. Here's just one example. These are a couple screenshots from a final project of one of my students last semester who made this um, really extensive web, com web comic about the um, jail project in Chinatown and um, has these like four different illustrated interviews. And I think she's still kind of um, tweaking it here, there, here and there, but really spent a ton of time on this and all, I mean, I'm just so impressed by the amount of work that students do in these classes. And it's, it's really inspiring to me as well, like as an artist um, and just the whole range of styles. So I would encourage anyone who's interested in nonfiction comics, who's interested in telling someone else's story, doing research, um, you know, 
pushing yourself to go out and, you know, talk to people and craft stories about it and also interact with such like a wonderful community of, of other makers who come from all different backgrounds. Um, that that's, you know, those are the kind of people who really benefit most from the courses that that I've been teaching. So if you have any questions, you can always feel free to email me. Um, you can check out my work on my website or on my Instagram. And um, yeah, I if you have any questions right now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen or, you know, wait until the end of the session, then feel free to ask. Thanks, Sarah. Um, does anyone have any questions at the moment? For Sarah for this amazing class. All right, I think we're gonna move on to our final uh, faculty member and presenter, um, which is Bob, uh, Bob Wallace. Um, and Bob is teaching an online and in-person class, two different, two different classes in different, different uh, formats um, on focusing on comedy. So Bob Wallace is a storyteller working in comedy, comics, animation, and film. They have served as host and producer of the alternative comedy show Zebro, The Moon, and Ideation. In collaboration with artist Tad Kinball, they created the animated series True Facts about the 44th President and Steven Tyler's iPad. Their first comics work, Adventures of the Moss Babies, made its debut at Emerald City Comic Con, where it was picked up for distribution by Comixology. So Bob, if you wanna just go ahead and take it away, um, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, let's see here. All right, uh, looks like that's working. Um, hello everybody, still with me everybody? Uh, can you hear me in there? Okay, this thing's jumping ahead already. Uh, so I'll keep it very brief because I really appreciate everyone sticking around uh, tonight and listening to all these great presentations. Um, I will say very briefly, I'm also privileged to be um, affiliated with the MFA Visual Narrative Program. And uh, I've been lucky enough to come in during the summers to run uh, one of the final uh, projects, which is often a... Uh, role-playing game using the characters that students have worked on and that's often a really good time and I'm looking forward to doing it again this uh, summer um, but also like everybody else sort of briefly touched on this is a bit of a community that involves both the Rizzo Lab the MFA program um, a lot of people who used to be uh, centrally located around a certain floors on a, a SVA campus but have now become more of an online community and maybe we're hoping to do uh bring bring it all back home and uh in the future we'll be doing both and that's what my class is hoping to do so uh for those students who can attend class on campus i think you'll get something out of um the live wire aspect of an uh, in-person on campus class those students who wish to uh to take class online um we'll also probably get a great deal out of it. And we have run it a few times that way. Um, and we, we make it work. Uh, the class itself is um, a number of pre-edited and pre-recorded lectures that cover topics like um, comedy as a genre, stand-up, and comedy as an element in storytelling. And then the weekly classes that are synchronous and um, that everyone dials into, which are very much live, are workshops that take you through exercises uh, that hopefully help you apply this, uh, these learnings to a uh, discipline of your choosing, whether that's um, traditional stand-up comedy writing uh, or sitcom writing, um, writing for film and television or video games, or even um, you know, if you're doing sequential art, or even if you're doing uh, like oil painting or sculpture or time-based art or site-specific art or virtual reality, this is a good thing uh, to, I think, equip yourself with as a storyteller. So I'm just gonna keep 
going through this presentation. We'll get through things really quickly. And if you do have any questions about this, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not going to cover everything entirely in the next three and a half minutes. So please do ask questions. If you have any, even if they're um, seemingly minor, we're here to answer your questions. So I'm going to just motor through this presentation. Uh, ever wonder what makes funny funny? This is high level. Why are some people funny and others aren't? Uh, comedy can be misconstrued as a mystical, either have it or you don't format, but joke writing, humor writing, whatever you want to call it, it's also a mechanical, knowable set of tools with which every storyteller should arm themselves, I, I believe anyways. Interrupting expectations is intended for students of all these disciplines, every discipline maybe you can think of, uh, or anyone interested in using comedy to make compelling visual narratives or even deconstruct the visual narratives that we are surrounded by. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but I like to break it down into uh, comedy as genre, which is a lot of what we see. Uh, television sitcom is a good example of uh, comedy as genre. Then comedy as an art form, which is what we think of as stand up, one person show, sometimes sketch and improv our comedy as an uh, art form. And then finally, comedy as an element in, sto in storytelling, which is where we encounter it most frequently, whether we're going to the big blockbuster film and there's a few jokes thrown in there or whether we're playing on our PlayStation and we encounter uh, written jokes there, that is comedy as an element in storytelling. And I think that's what students come away uh, with the ability to, to use in their own work or one would hope, I would hope, at the end of this course. So a little bit about me is um, I do a lot of uh, cool person stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking at this now. DJ, comic book creator, comedian. Um, I've been in New York too long, basically. Uh, I do I do a lot of things like, like other people on this panel. I've also worked in advertising, uh, television, um, and, you know, when we build these creative skills, we find ourselves in the course of a lot of different kinds of work. Um, so we'll talk a lot about that in this course. I like to have students go through the exercise of building a pitch deck, which is a unit of currency in a lot of these creative fields that I don't feel like I was properly trained in. So I try to supplement that with some things in my class. And we talk about how to pitch creative concepts that will turn into commercial uh, contracts, perhaps. I think that's uh, useful beyond just comedy storytelling. And it's something I've had to encounter a number of times. So something I like to bake into the class. Um, comedy as a genre, here's some examples. Um, in the first part of the class unit, first unit one, uh, we explore um, comedy as a genre. And I like to take clips from popular sitcoms and animated shows. And we basically clock the amount of joke. We set a timer and we count the amount of jokes and punchlines. Uh, and we try to agree upon a molecule, a unit of measure of comedy uh, that we can sort of build from, um, where we're basically comparing our counts and why they're different. And we sort of every single semester agree differently, but on some measure of what's a joke, what's a quantifiable measure of comedy. And from there, we will uh, find ourselves able to move on pretty quickly into comedy as it is performed in a live setting. And this is something I hope to uh, benefit from returning to campus. Uh, don't be afraid. That's all I'll say, I'll just keep moving past this. <laughs> don't be afraid. A lot of people <laughs> have been, have been uh, uh, scared or thrown off of the, the trail by, by comedy. And we'll talk about a bit more of what's required of the students. Um, very briefly here, you you will have to perform some of your written material in front of the other students, whether that's online or in person. I'm sorry, there's no other way around it. And it is very scary. And I've had students drop out before that week. I've had, this is a very scary thing for people, but I guarantee you that if you show up, engage with this material and engage in these exercises, you will come out transformed and in, uh, in in be able to engage with your, um, written and drawn and sculpted material in brand new ways. Uh, so nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, comedy as an element in storytelling is what I, again, chiefly concerned of uh, with 
trying to arm uh, students of different disciplines with the ability to use jokes, not just comedy people, comedians, funny people, so on. So we're trying to completely demystify that concept uh, because anyone can use comedy in this uh, mechanical way. It's a basically, it's a very basic thing. Once you establish rigor, once you establish with an audience, a set of expectations, if they think they know what's coming next, interrupt that process. That surprise is biologically typically what makes people laugh. It is a form of surprise that we're going to learn how to hack together uh, so that our, our narratives are richer, more enjoyable, and that we're more in control of the emotional spectrum that we're using. Uh, so upon completion of this course, you should be able to identify and evaluate common structures, shapes, and humor writing. Number two, uh, evaluate inherent assumptions in any given joke, which is very important right now where humor is also political and we get into that in the course, but this will help you hopefully navigate uh, an already chaotic world, maybe with a little more clarity because this world is full of humor and sometimes assumptions are baked into things and we talk about that. Uh, also, you should be able to create and perform pieces of written comedy with intention and clarity and employ these learnings or practices in an original text of your chosen discipline. So you'll come out of this semester with having made something uh, and, and having changed, learn something. So finally, even if you don't take this class, remember, take away from this info session that you don't have to be funny uh, to be funny, so to speak. So thanks for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Bob. And I think, you know, the reentry uh, sort of in this sort of uh, gradual post COVID or, you know, late COVID, whatever you want to call it, situation we're in is, is ripe with opportunity for uh, um, all kinds of misunderstandings that might be uh, hilarious. So I think that the, you know, just we could just lean into the awkwardness and I got to take your class at some point. Joan took it, uh, our lab tech, Andrew, uh, took it, I believe, and they, they had a great time. Definitely, they speak very, very highly of it. Does anyone have any questions um, for, uh, specifically for Bob? And I, I see, and also you can, by the way, you can, uh, you can type your questions into the chat. I see some general questions um, and some specific, specific questions. Any questions for Bob about the comedy, comedy class? Okay. Um, and, and, you know, to all the, of our instructors, if you think of anything that you want to add, since we, uh, now that, you know, while we still have everyone here, um, feel free to jump in while we kind of go through some of these questions. So one question is to, to Pan and Aiden, there's no way to join online or your Rizzo Zine class, Rizzo Zines class or Rizzo art book abstract uh, comics class. Um, if you're in California, the, uh, that's correct. The zine and intro classes are in person. Um, and so, you know, it might've been a little bit because we're offering both online and in-person classes. Um, we're offering four in-person classes, the mini, the mini uh, comics, or five, including Bob's um, comedy class. So four in-person Rizzo classes, one is full, the mini comics class is full. The zines, the zine and intro classes that I'm teaching are in person. So you, if you're in California, unless you want to commute 16 hours, I don't know how much time that would leave you. Um, or if you if you commuted once a week from the West Coast, that might be a little insane. But yes, uh, you wouldn't be able to join that class. You could take the online class and then plan to then make a trip to New York and take the boot camp. Um, and and the boot camp comes with six weeks of access to the Rezo Lab. But we have had students that take the boot camp just for a weekend, uh, you know, just for the chance to use the space and to make a few prints. Um, the price point it's at is similar to that you might, which you might get charged by an independent artist or publisher who has a Rezo in their studio who invites uh, students in for a, a, a day long workshop. So you're kind of getting, you know, they would charge 350 and you would walk away with a few prints. But in this case, you then have six weeks of access. So if you're local, you could keep coming back and printing. So, um, yeah, so those are those are in person. Uh, general question for all instructors: How many hours of homework would you estimate your course for your course each week? 
um, or is all work done during class sessions? I think for all of these classes, we're, you know, we're really trying to, even though the, these are continuing education classes, um, they're not matriculated, matriculated classes for undergraduate or graduate students, but we're still approaching them um, from a, we're all, I think we're all taking a very serious approach, but I think that question will be different for everyone. Um, so I guess, I guess that has to do with a specific class. Um, you know, it, and that also depends on your own project and your own goal. So I would say just with my classes, maybe you put in a, a you know, it's I, ideally you would put in a total of like, you know, four to eight hours outside of class working a little bit each day on your project, but maybe you already have work that's ready to publish. Um, and then you come in outside of class for a few hours, uh, booking some printing time in the Rizzo lab. Um, does anyone else want to chime in? Um, Sarah, Bob, Bob? Uh, yeah, you? I see a question here for me. Um, so I will answer that. And I think with, with a lot of our classes, I will say for mine anyways, the amount of homework ramps up toward the end of semester as you begin to work on like a final project. Uh, but I would, I would count on definitely planning to dedicate uh, one to 10 hours, depending on the week, uh, beyond class time to, to this, because we are um, a lot of times asking you to continue the discipline that you're already working in, but just apply these new things to it. So um, sometimes that means you know, uh, an, an hour of reading. Sometimes that means, like we're saying with sequential art and other things that might mean, you know, seven, eight hours of, of extra work. So um, it is a commitment, but it's definitely something you're gonna come away with a whole new set of skills. I will also say for my class, uh, do we address the issue of political correctness when crafting a pitch? Um, and I think on a more fundamental level, we just address the, the general way of how to unpack and evaluate the assumptions that are hidden in any piece of humor or really piece of communication. And I think that's something that I concern myself with very much uh, when we're being, if we're being politically um, anything, we wanna know exactly how we're coming across and the part of the class explicitly concerns itself with that. So, yes. Um, and I see that some, uh, it looks like Sarah and Suzanne have both um, made a comment, uh, you know, spoken to, to the amount of work that goes, that, that you know, you might expect to put into your class, and I know I know with Ren's class, it's very uh, you know it's it's you know comics takes a long time, so it is I, I do believe there's a there's an expectation that you that you go through specific exercises every week, and you know if Ren wants to elaborate on that, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are different things that I ask of you each week. So it's like especially towards the beginning, it'll be like oh do thumbnail sketches this week, and it's it's really um, subjective based on your own practice, you know, uh, however long it takes you, it takes you. So like if, uh, and also like how polished you want the finished product to be, um, which it, it doesn't have to be polished. If you want to come in and, and spend an hour outside of class each week drawing stick figures and, and uh, that's how you want to uh, communicate and that's how you want to uh, tell your story, absolutely come in and do it. But um, uh, there, there's uh, also the potential for you to spend, you know, 24 hours outside of class if you want to. So it's, it's, it's really subjective based on how much work you want to put into it. I would agree with Ren for my class as well. Um, also, I would say I didn't really mention when I was presenting to like these course, like this course is anyone who wants to sign up can like it's built for all levels. And it's really just up to you how much time you want to put into your assignments. So you can kind of like, it can be flexible in that way. But I have students present um, work in progress all the time. And even for the final project too, oftentimes I'll tell them like, what do you want from the class? And what do you want from having an audience and your classmates here? And if your story maybe is like a little bit more in depth and you have less time to like 
do the, you know, finished artwork, then it is more about like, at least for my class, it is more about um, getting the story down than like the actual craft of, of drawing and um, your style. Although we do discuss that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think there's a question about uh, specifically uh, Suzanne's class, Creative Writing for Visual Artists. Um, in terms of getting the syllabus, Suzanne, could this, uh, and by the way, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be following up, I'll be emailing you all since uh, um, the emails that you, that you um, entered when you signed up for the, um, for the info session, I'll be sending you all contact information for everyone as well. But um, probably if you'd like the syllabus, uh, Suzanne can probably provide that with you. So yeah, um, I already responded to okay. that person directly. Um, but if anybody and if anybody else is interested in having a look at the syllabus, just send me an email and I'm happy to um, to send you a copy of that and um, give you more of an idea of sort of what the classes is like. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's like Sarah's class. It's a lot of it is there's um, there are two hours a week of Zoom the first part of the class, we talk about some aspect of, of writing um, or different kinds of writing. We cover things like, you know, most of it is focused on story, but there are things like audience and voice and, um, you know, what makes poetry its own special thing, um, you know, story arcs and, um, you know, character development and stuff like that. And, um, so there's there's um, sort of a lecture and a discussion of readings that students have done before class, and then every class has a writing exercise um, to get you started for the week on what you'll be working on for the week. Um, and then we also there's also plenty of opportunity to get feedback, not only from me but from your your fellow classmates. But I'm happy to um, send that syllabus to anybody who wants it. Just um, send me an email. Um, I'm one, one question that we often get, I'm surprised no one's asked to get, uh, we often have perspective or people that are interested in, in these classes ask what level of Photoshop or uh, Adobe Suite experience is needed. Um, some, you know, some basic familiarity with the programs I think is helpful. And then also, at least with the, class I te the classes I teach, um, and then also uh, some kind of a visual art practice, I think is also helpful, but we have had writers and people who don't have a specific visual practice that they, you know, sort of dust off something that they, that they sort of did, um, you know, on their own um, as a hobby and, and revive that practice by using some of the techniques that, that we went over, um, that we go over, uh, in my classes, as far, as far as Photoshop and you know Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator, um, you know uh, I should say first that you also, if you don't have an, if you don't already have a subscription to the Creative Cloud, this, the class actually comes with um, a subscription, so you get access to all the programs for the duration of the class, whether it's online or whether it's in person. Um, and the way I the way I show how to prepare files, it's almost like a different way to use these programs. So you may use them every day in your creative practice, whether you're a illustrator or a photographer, um, there's different, there's so many different ways to use these programs. And I think it's almost like we're starting from scratch again and using them in a really fundamental way. So that's maybe a, kind of a mixed answer, but um, uh, the fact that you get access to these programs, we don't have them is something that um, is easy to overlook. It's just a detail. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, does anyone have any other questions about the classes? Um, or the Rezo Lab, Visual Narrative Program? All right, so um, if any of our instructors, do, you, do if anyone has any sort of last, last comments that maybe you, you sort of uh, didn't get to address when you gave your presentation. Does anyone want to add anything? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, sorry, I, I was having some trouble with um, headphones. I have uh, one question about the 
which is pretty specific about the facilities. Um, to what extent do you get into book binding? Um, maybe you get this question often, but you know, because when when you print something that's pretty thick, at some point you need to change uh, to another kind of uh, binding, like perfect binding, for, for example. And then I had another question, one for Sarah, is um, how open are you to uh, work with um, not necessarily illustration, but maybe other methods of creating images like photography or like some sort of like digital yeah, ways of doing it? Yeah, I've had um, in my, not comics journalism, but in my graphic memoir class, I had a photographer join once and um, then he actually ended up doing a lot of drawing afterwards. But, um, but yeah, I'm definitely open to experimenting with different types of images. Most of the, um, most of the work that we'll look at will be drawing and sometimes there are some other um, other things I'll show that like combine different sorts of media. So just, you know, keep that in mind that that's like most of the resources that we'll talk about um, in terms of like style and, and whatnot. But you're definitely, um, if you did want to join the course, you're definitely welcome to um, create the kind of artwork you want, just as long as you're combining text and image um, to tell stories. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and and uh, to your that's I'm great. I'm glad you asked about binding because we're uh, you know we're about to potentially add a number of um, new tools for different kinds of binding. But generally at the Rizzo Lab, uh, we have um, a range of saddle staplers. We have um, bone folders. Everything is sort of done uh, kind of by hand um at, at the moment and that's that's the that's like we don't have a perfect binder yet but we have a list of of sort of um we have a wish list that, that hopefully we'll be able to um introduce into the lab starting in july when our new fiscal year opens up so i'm actually working that out right now hopefully some kind of a um rudimentary perfect binder uh if not a sort of large scale professional one, but, but uh, you know, automatic folders, booklet makers, automatic, uh, semi-automatic uh, creasing machines. These are all things that we don't have yet, but we, they're long overdue in terms of adding them to our, uh, our fleet, our facility of, um, you know, all the tools we have. And in terms of the actual, uh, you know, on our website, it, it does list, uh, maybe it's not completely up to date, but it does list the equipment we have. Right now we have four resographs, if you're familiar, we have two ME 9450s. We have one MZ 1090 and we have one MF 9450. So those are all, that's that's kind of like the, the three newest two drum machines. Um, and we have about, at this point, I think we have about 16 or 17 colors between the two. There's two different sets of drums. Um, the older machines can all work with the same drums. The newer machine has its own set of drums. Um, so yeah, we have a pretty nice range of colors to work with at this point. So it's, it's about adding different binding capabilities, hopefully, both in terms of more automa automated and more professional tools, but also um, in the other direction, I'm also interested in introducing some more hand binding techniques that come from artist books uh, and things like um, a book cradle to make it easy, easier to add if you're doing um, a stab binding and different kinds of thread and things like that, um, book clamps. So you can sort of a, a, attack a book project from both ends of the, but that's at this, at the moment, we, we basically have large format saddle staplers, bone folders. It's all kind of like by hand DIY style and, and a large, a large uh, manual, but uh, a, a, real, a real beast and workhorse of a stack cutter. So you can cut um, a huge stack of books down that really speeds up. Uh, finishing and production. But I, I saw that you had, um, so I guess that potentially like, you know, part of the process could be done at the Rice Lab. And then if someone wants to do perfect binding, you can send it out maybe. Absolutely. Around, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, and a lot of, a lot of people do that. They'll, they'll do the printing at the lab because that's sort of, that's our main, uh, it, it's a coveted resource and, and to have a machine uh, in your studio or in your home, it, it's a big commitment financially and also in terms of space 
So that's the gap that we fill. So it, we believe that um, it, to get involved in retail printing, it, it does it's not practical, it's not sensible um, for every single artist or potential publisher to buy a Rezo um, and, and sort of have their own setup. Our space is designed so that, you know, you could, you could start off uh, doing your production in our space and do your publishing in our space and then eventually maybe uh, work your way up to investing in your own, your own uh, equipment. But, um, but yeah, you know, just New York City uh, square footage uh, is, is, I mean, it's one of the most expenses, expensive places in the world in terms of the value of, of space. Um, and the, the interesting thing about our space too is that we're supporting underground culture, we're supporting uh, people's interests in developing the skills to create these projects that are like often based on an idea that is initially aggressively uh, non-commercial, you know, um, to just kind of explore this idea. Uh, but we were on the 11th floor of a building in, uh, on the edge of Chelsea in Manhattan. So we're surrounded by multi-million dollar views and condos um, and we're supporting this underground culture. Normally a space like ours would be in a basement, um, but we're right there uh, in, in Manhattan. So that's another kind of nice aspect of our space is the view and the vibe and everything. So um, does that kind of answer your question about equipment? Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, and I have like a last question, which For is sure. uh, probably like a pretty dumb question, um, but um, I assume that the Rezo printer can print on both sides of the paper and keep registration right so everything is printed as you want it to be printed on each side right yeah well the thing about Rezo again it was since it was uh it's it's a volume high volume printer that is designed the way it's designed it's like it's supposed to be efficient and easy to use so you can learn how to use it in about 10 minutes to make basic one or two color copies um but it wasn't designed for for precision you know it was designed for speed and for value for for you know the inks are very cheap the more you print the cheaper it gets um and it prints very very fast and it can take a variety of different kinds of media but uh famously rezos are famous for their imprecision and the fact that sometimes it's very difficult to get things to line up that's what people actually really love about it um we're working with the newest machines so with i will say with our mf9450 that the alignment is within uh it's within like a, a millimeter or two um so you can get very very tight registration but sort of designing with that in mind and being open to create you know sort of doubling down on things like trapping where you have two layers overlapping slightly around the edge so if they if they don't line up perfectly you don't get a white gap um, and just creating designs where they don't have to be ultra precise and ultra perfect. And you can work around that and create something. We aim for, at least in my class, we strive for perfection, but we also accept imperfection. And you know, it's up to you as to how much of what's not perfect that you throw away and don't add to your addition, how much of it do you sort of just bind in? You know, For me, I think that's happy accidents. I often find that the kinds of mistakes that drive you crazy as a printer and as a print designer, um, those are the prints that, that, that people uh, prefer, you know, when you're at a book fair, when you're doing an event and people are looking through, they might, you might, they might look at a zine where it's completely off register, got bound into the edition by accident. They want that one because it's unique. Um, so I think in a way that's part of the novelty of it. But to answer your question, yes, we do print double-sided. Um, you ideally want to wait for one side to dry before you run it through again, but um, sort of approaching it in a way where you have guardrails, we have a uh, gripper margin, like space around the edge, registration marks, um, taking any of the three cla four classes that we offer that are in person will give you a lot of tools to, to get close to perfection, if not actually nail it. So. Thank you. I know Aiden, I know also Aiden, um, as the sort of co-founder of Cold Cube Press, your press, you guys have done some really precise work and also worked with some really big editions and worked with outside book binders. Um, and also doing contract work, which I also did when I first bought a Resograph before I started running the, the Rezo Lab. Um, you, when you're, when you're doing a project for someone else, you're always striving for perfection. When I'm kind of bringing my own work, I'm more loose and open. And I allow things to, you know, these, misprints are almost like the printer is collaborating with you and it's almost, it makes it more painterly, but I don't know if, if Aiden, if you wanted to speak to that at all. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, yeah, definitely printing for clients. I want to get as perfect as I possibly can. But in terms of like registering your work, um, it's all about experience on the machine, how, how much you can dial in, uh, how everything will line up is based on like, yeah, what you know about printing and your time spent on the machine. But also, like you said, Pan, like if you're setting up your work uh, so that you don't need to be exactly precise within a half a millimeter, or if you are, um, I think one of the things that you might learn in my class or maybe in Ren's class as well is that the Rezo uh, will, it won't change your work, but it will change how you work, right? So especially as, as you're learning how the Rezo prints, you're learning how you can adapt your work to be printed on the Rezo, but you could, you're also learning, oh, well, if I'm just printing this in two colors, uh, and I can sort of like shift values around your learning techniques like trapping, you can also sort of fit in like, well, this Rezo, yeah, it's not accurate all the time, but I'm gonna figure out how to make my work really sing with that misregistration. Like um, the sort of golden and silver age of comics and all these sort of older offset comics from the 20th century. I mean, if you look at old, um, yeah, newspaper comics, the, they look amazing when they're off register, you know? So I think that, yeah, sometimes the best work comes when stuff is just a little bit off. There's a little bit of vibration. And um, what we learn in our classes is that, you know, sort of harnessing that energy is kind of what we're, what we're after. Any other questions for any of the instructors or about the lab, about the Vision Narrative program. Um, one last note, I just wanna mention, uh, and by the way, um, if you, in case you missed it, the link to all the classes is posted the last, the second to last comment in the chat. So if you wanna just go, that's the general page on the SVA website that has all the visual narrative um, classes, uh, actually above the link for Suzanne's class. So you'll find all the classes there. Also on the Weasel Lab website, um, we have the direct links to just the Rezo classes. So I'll just add that. Um, Rezolab.sv.edu. Um, and one final note I just wanted to mention was uh, if you take an in-person class right at the moment, um, SVA does require uh, all attendees to be vaccinated and boosted. So I just want to make, you know, just before, uh, you know, just in case you're considering an in-person class, um, and that's, it's good to keep that in mind. So that's, um, and it's also good to, to kind of uh, stay up to date on what the, what the requirements are because, you know, all that stuff is, has been, as we know, continuously kind of changing and shifting with, with the current state of things. So, um, all right, so if, if no one has any other questions, um, I think we can I think we can wrap it up for the evening. Thank you all so much for making it um, to the end and for, uh, for attending and uh, watching our presentations. Um, I'm gonna be sending again, like I said, a follow-up email to everyone who RSVP'd from the event. So you'll get a link to the recording in case you showed up late uh, in case those of you who had to dip out, um, you had to leave. Uh, so you can, you can sort of uh, go back and watch parts that you may have missed and also send links to the, the sign up links and contact info for our instructors. Um, all right, so hopefully we'll see some of you either online or in our space. Um, have a good night and, uh, and you know, feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions that you think of later on. Bye. Thanks, guys.